What's up, everybody? Brothers, sisters, psychonauts, and seekers of truth. It is Ananka, and welcome to my bazaar. Today, I'll be reading the Norse legend, The Binding of the Wolf. This version comes from the book, Viking Spirit, by Daniel McCoy. With all that being said, let our story begin. Loki had many children with many different mothers and fathers. With the giantess Angerboda, he had three. One was Hel, the ghastly goddess who presided over the underworld. The second was Jormungand, the great serpent who festered beneath the ocean his elongated body encircling the land. And the third was Fenrir, an enormous and ravenous wolf. When they were first born, however, these children of Loki had not acquired these roles that they would later assume. Angerboda suckled them in Jotunheim, the land of the giants, and at first they seemed scarcely more dangerous than any other giant. But as they grew, and as the gods got wind of ominous prophecies that foretold that the doom of the cosmos would one day come through these fell creatures, the deities assembled together to address the peril that loomed before them. Odin ordered that the three be brought before him, and as soon as he saw how prodigiously they had grown since the last time he had laid eyes on them, and how much more dreadful each of the monsters seemed than before, he immediately cast two of them into remote regions from which they could do the gods relatively little harm at least for the time being. Hell, he sank into the underworld, which is how she received her position as the ruler of the dead. And Jormungand he threw into the ocean, which in time he almost outgrew, to the point that he had to wrap himself around the entire world just to fit. Fenrir, however, inspired so much fear in the gods' hearts that they decided to rear the pup themselves in Asgard, where they could keep an eye on him. Of all of them, only the brave Tyr dared to go near enough to his pen to give him the ever more massive slabs of meat that he required every day to keep him fed. Eventually, however, the wolf grew so grotesquely large that the divinities could no longer bear to maintain him so close to them. They thought of killing him, but couldn't bear the thought of desecrating their holy stronghold with bloodshed, so they hatched a plan to disarm him. They presented Fenrir with a strong chain and proposed a game to him. They would tie him in the fetter and let him break free to demonstrate his incredible strength. The wolf scoffed at what seemed like a puny string and agreed to play. As soon as he was bound, he gave a half-hearted struggle and easily snapped the chain. Then the gods had another chain forged, one that was stronger by half than the first, and presented this to Fenrir on the same terms. The wolf thought the task of escaping from this bond to be more daunting than the previous one, but he wanted the whole world to know his strength. So he accepted the risk and agreed to a second round of the game. 
when the fetter was placed around him. He struggled mightily for a long time, but in the end, tore through this chain and gloried in his feet. After this formidable accomplishment, the gods began to worry that they might never successfully bind the wolf. Their only hope was to have the dwarves, those master craftsmen, build the most exquisite chain that anyone had ever seen. They sent Frey's emissary, Skirnir, to the land of the dwarves to explain the situation and enlist their aid in neutralizing this cosmic terror. The result of this mission was the fetter Gleipnir, which the dwarves had made from the sound of a cat's footsteps, a woman's beard, the roots of a mountain, a bear's tendon, a fish's breath, and the spittle of a bird. These are the things that no one has ever encountered, and which, therefore, can never be put to the test. The gods then took Fenrir with them to a remote, marshy island in the middle of a wide lake. There, the gods presented the third chain to Fenrir. The wolf appraised it with puzzlement. It looked like a tiny silk cord, so thin that it was almost invisible. The beast suspected trickery, but knew that he would be called a coward and his reputation ruined if he refused. So he declared that he would agree to be bound with this manacle, but only if one of the deities would place his or her hand in the wolf's mouth as a pledge that they weren't trying to deceive him. The deities were astonished and afraid. They should have expected such a demand from the wolf, and perhaps in their hearts they had. But now that the time had come for one of them to sacrifice a hand, to uphold a false oath, or for all of them to refuse and allow the wolf to know their plot and arouse his anger, they all demurred. All, that is, except Tyr, who agreed to the wolf's term. He stuck his trembling hand in the beast's hot, wet mouth and felt his razor-sharp teeth laying lightly on his wrist. Gleipnir was tied around Fenrir, and the contest began. Fenrir struggled with all his might, but the more he struggled, the tighter the fetter wound itself around him. In the end, he found himself unable to move at all. All of the gods were doubled over in laughter at the wolf's sorry predicament, except for Tyr, who duly lost his hand. The gods tied a heavy chain to Gleipnir, then tied the chain to a great boulder, then drove that boulder into the ground with an even greater one pinning the wolf in place. When he opened his mouth to try to bite his captors, they thrust a sword between his jaws to hold them agape and unable to clamp down. He howled ferociously and unceasingly, and his saliva began to form into a gushing river. And there he is laid throughout the aeons, striving futilely against his imprisonment. But at Ragnarok, the prophecies foretell he will win his freedom at last and shall have his vengeance upon the gods 
and their world.